Well, let's see what fascinating pubescent treasures Chris has got hidden away. Ooh, Hustler magazine. I finally get to see what a vagina looks... Ah, ah, oh, God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Ah! You can't hurt anyone anymore. Your friends are nerdy and you are nerdy too. I want to talk to you, Friends Talking Nerdy. Welcome to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. This is Tim Giles, man. We got Ray here without having to wait another six months for Ray to be on the show. Welcome, Yay, Ray. Finally, geez. I know, I'm so bad. <laughs> Um, but we have a topic today that we are definitely excited to uh, talk about, and we're going to talk about some good old-fashioned pornography. And with that, we got a very special guest uh, with us today, someone who I've been following on Twitter for uh, for a while now. And, and uh, you know, every tweet that, that comes their way, um, you know, some, if I'm at work, sometimes I got to hide the tweet. But um, if uh, but it's it's still great to see what she has to say. And our special guest today, our second ever celebrity guest is D Severe. How are you doing? I'm doing good. You've been watching not suitable for work stuff at work, huh? <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, it, one of those guilty things like you see it and all of a sudden did anybody watch me? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say it's a good way of finding out which of your co-workers are kinky. Yeah. I, they walk by you and kind of go, oh, my God. You know, they, like, nod, and if they're like, oh, hello, you know they are. I absolutely love playing that game of who's kinky or not, because I have my suspicions whenever I'm at work, but I'm just like, uh. Let's do a quick test and see. <laughs> yeah, and like uh, bringing up uh, the episode with uh, one of our co-hosts, Maura, today, I brought up uh, uh, something we're going to talk about, tickle torture, and she was like, you've never heard of that before, Tim? And that, that surprised me with Maura. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We've done that for a long time. Yeah, and you definitely seem to have a lot of fun in the video clips I saw. But um, when we have somebody new on the show, we always got to ask, what is your nerd origin story? My nerd origin story? Um... I, I guess I am sort of a nerd because I, you know, like I, I do live in my, like on my computer and stuff and kind of hang out with my dogs a lot. Um, I basically, I've been around for a while. I, I started out as a rock journalist and then I was like a freelance writer for a long time and then I got into screenwriting and found mainstream film industry to be very, very frustrating and like mm -hmm. it all involved kind of like sitting around and rewriting scripts and having meetings and no movie making. Um, and let's see, then I met my kinky now husband and partner, Jimmy Broadway, and we were in a mainstream short film collective and we were kind of thinking of doing a, like a low budget horror movie we could produce ourselves. And at that point we were broke, so I got a part time job as a pro dominatrix and as it happened, the guy who owned the dungeon wanted to get into the porn biz. So we were like, well, you know, we're in this short film group. We could kind of make these movies for you. So so we got for two years, we got to make movies for somebody else on spending, like making all our rookie mistakes on someone else's nickel, which was pretty awesome. And then we went out on our own with Severe Society Films, which was our first label. And then in 2004, we got picked up by a big distributor and rebranded as Severe Sex Films. And... That's what we are now. Nice. Uh, making a very long story short. <laughs> That's uh, nope. super awesome, though. Like going from like low budget horror to now this huge kind of like porn distributor. It's super awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I got to ask since you brought it up, um, since you got your career as a, a, a freelance journalist, um, what are some experiences you can tell us about your time writing for Rolling Stone or The Hollywood Reporter or some of your, the other publications you've been published in? It was really, I mean, for somebody like for, for doing it in your 20s, it was awesome. Um, 
um, you know, I got to, you know, fly around, like, Europe and all of America, again, on someone else's nickel. I'm really, like, big on that, having experiences that other people pay for. <laughs> and, um, you know, like, I got to meet a lot of, you know, I got to interview a lot of really interesting, cool people, some of whom turned out to be just as great as their music and some of whom turned out to be total assholes and were kind of a disappointment. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, I, I mean, it was really, really great. Um, when I got, when I started getting a little older and no longer wanted to, you know, go to clubs five nights a week and listen to like a hundred new CDs a, a week, you know, I, I got very burned out on it, you know, which is kind of the point where, except like I, I did the Hollywood Reporter for a long time. I kind of kept my thumb in by just doing live like live reviews for them like once a week or something. But, you know, it wasn't like that really intense thing. Um, but I don't know, what was what were some of the best experiences? I got to sit on the side of the stage at a giant arena show with Aerosmith and Guns N' Roses and oh. Deep Purple. I remember that as being pretty pretty fun. Um, I'm jealous of I, <laughs> uh, I got to interview Ozzy Osbourne a whole bunch of times. He was my favorite interview because depending on whether or not he was sober or not, it was like a really, really big <laughs> change and he kind of talked about stuff that was like really inappropriate and especially when he was drunk, he would talk about stuff that's like, dude, do you really want that to be published? And you kind of have to edit him out because it's like, I liked him and I didn't want to like publish stuff that I do that look, would just look horrifying. Um, <laughs> Um, let's see. The, uh, what else do I remember? Um, let's see. I met Lou Reed, and he turned out to be a total jerk, and he hated me, which just crushed me because I loved him. Oh, um, let's see. That, that, those are some of the highlights, but, you know, there, there was a lot. I did it from, like, the late 80s to, like, full-time to, like, the mid-90s, and then I did The Hollywood Reporter for, like, 10 more years, just kind of to keep my... I thumb and I kind of quit doing it at the time when I started getting involved in the BDSM community and, and was doing, you know, I was doing a lot of like um, trade and kind of technical writing that, which made more money and didn't involve going to clubs five nights a week, but it was also, you know, it was very time consuming. So I kind of, I had like all this stuff going on. There was just like too much. So I finally decided to give like the whole music thing a break. Right. In doing all of this, is that how you got introduced to the BDSM lifestyle, or how did you come across that? Uh, the BDSM world, I was always, in my heart, I was always kinky. Like, very early on in my life, I had some um, like some BDSM experiences, but it was, it kind of, it was like kind of back when it, it's like it's much more mainstream now. So, right. you know, because of all the Fifty Shades things, like back in like the, the early, the, like late 80s and 90s, it was really, really secretive. Like people just didn't talk about it. You kind of thought there was something wrong with you. So I kind of didn't, like I always had these fantasies, but I kind of didn't deal with them for a long time. And, you know, I, like my first husband was a vanilla husband and he kind of wasn't into it. <laughs> um, so when I, when we got divorced and I moved out to LA which was like in 95 I kind of felt like okay you know I've kind of got this fresh start here like I want to be with somebody who wants to do this kinky stuff I'm kind of tired of having that you're in a vanilla relationship and you're like trying to pretend that the sex is everything you want it to be and it's really not the mm -hmm. kind of stuff you want to do and you're not doing it um, so at that point I started, like, this is, it, it was far enough back where people still put ads in papers. It wasn't, like, all online yet. So I started putting ads in, like, the LA Weekly saying, you know, like, I was an amateur dominatrix and I, I wanted to find people to play with. And, like, I did that and I did alt.com. And then I got, like, zillions of responses. It was like, I, I found, it's like, oh, okay, there's, like, a really big disproportionate thing of men and women to this thing. Um... So then I kind of like had a lot of like lunch dates and found a couple people to play with and then like about a year later um, I met my now husband on alt.com and like we pretty much like our first date lasted the weekend and we were together ever since so that was just like you know, like he was like it was like the trifecta it was like he was kinky he was cute he liked animals and we had like a lot of the other vanilla things in common and he was in live TV production and was kind of interested in getting into filmmaking the same as I was so it was like okay you're perfect I can stop looking yeah. so <laughs> that's kind of how that happened 
yeah, and I read too the the, the, the an interview that that uh, you gave about uh, your first date with him that he showed up with uh, in one hand roses and in the other hand some dog treats for your dogs. Yes, yes, that gave me that that got like such big points. <laughs> you know, it was it was like he just did it like just right. Nice. Um, yes. Yeah, well, okay, during my research, I listened to uh, an episode of Inside the Industry podcast and um, that you were a guest on, and you had mentioned, uh-huh. you had mentioned that uh, BDSM injuries were on the rise thanks to uh, what you mentioned earlier, Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, tell yes. the folks about um, your King School film series and how they can benefit people who want to be introduced to the BDSM lifestyle. Um, I think it's really important to... Um, I mean, BDSM is super fun, and it's like a huge adrenaline rush. It's a huge endorphin rush. It, you know, delves into your deepest fantasies. So it's like it's very, very intimate if you're doing it with with somebody you care about. But it also has the potential to have a lot of like even things that you wouldn't think of. For instance, if you leave somebody's hands tied too tightly or for too long, you can cause permanent nerve damage in their hands. Um, so that whole thing about you can use silk scarves or pantyhose to tie up your hands. No, you really shouldn't do that if you can really seriously, like permanently injure your partner. Um, so there's a lot of those little things that people, you know, you shouldn't just watch Fifty Shades of Grey and go, well, that was kind of hot. Let's try this, honey. Um, because you just can't. It's like one of those things of, you know, you need, you need some training. So um, basically our King School series addresses that and you know, we've got three DVDs on, on BDSM, beginning, intermediate, and advanced, and it takes you everywhere from, you know, this is a flogger, this is the end you flog with, to here's how to do suspension bondage, you know, so and kind of everything in between, and it gives you, like, if, if you're, if you just want to, like, play around a little bit, you know, the beginning one will probably do it for you, but if you're really... You know, if you're really into it, like if you start doing it, it's like, yeah, this is really like, you know, resonating with me and it's resonating with my partner when we get into it, then I'd suggest not only do you need DVDs, but you'd also, um, you should take, like, for instance, if you're doing anything like single tail whipping, we do an introduction to it, but you should definitely take some classes. Like, just about every big city has dungeons that offer classes, and just about every big city has, um, like uh, BDSM organizations like an LA threshold that are just for lifestyle players and most of those offer classes. So, you know, if you're if you really want to get into the heavy stuff, it's much better to kind of get, you know, in person instruction. Um, there's only so much you can do with DVDs, but DVDs can definitely give you a good background. Um, and in the series we also cover other stuff like we covered, you know, anal play of various sorts. We covered sissy slut play, which is a big component of femdom. Um, We interviewed a lot of uh, doms, both female and male doms, um, about, you know, hints how to make your experience a good one. And um, and all the DVDs also have like playtime scenes, so it's not like all instruction. It's also it's also fun time. Um, so we've we've covered a really broad range of stuff. There's basically we're um, we're on I guess we're on number nine. We just did number nine, so um, there's there's quite a few of them. Yeah, I saw that, and some of the ones uh, surprised me, like uh, needle play. I n- never heard yeah. of that. Needle play is an advanced one, and it's not for everybody. And that one is a really good example of, of something that can, like, again, it can be like a really big endorphin rush and can be really cool. Um, but also, because there's, like, uh, blood pathogens involved, you have to be really, 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 really super strict about um, keeping everything sanitary. Um, I mean, you pretty much have to do, like, hospital procedures because of, you don't want to get anything infected. Um, so the, you know, Betty Bondage, who did that segment for us, is really an expert in that. You know, she really goes into detail about how exactly you do the procedure to keep everything, like, nice and clean and safe. Nice. Is needle play separate from suspension? Or is it kind of like this? From what? Uh, from suspension? Yes. Okay. Needle play is basically you're using, um, you're using very, very sharp, like, medical needle 
like needle things. I'm not. I'm. I'm not into this. I can't remember the exact <laughs> name of them, but it's like a special needle that comes in a container, um, and they're extremely, extremely sharp. And it's basically putting them under the skin, just very, like a very low level. Um, it's not like poking it in. It's, it's kind of like sliding it in sideways, if that makes sense. And you can kind of make patterns with them. Um, and it's basically it's, it's basically about adrenaline, and you can do you can do things like like when Betty demonstrated it, she kind of did a pattern, and then she kind of did took a ribbon and did like a corset weave in the pattern. It was really cool looking, kind of a morbid way. Um, so the, yeah, it's completely different. For suspension bondage is basically uh, suspending someone when they're off the ground with rope. You know, the two things are completely different. Got it, got it. Um, so I wanted to ask, did you hear about the uh, fetish site kink, their armory closing down? Do you think that's going to have uh, an impact on the like kink community? Um, I think it will in a way. It's basically, I mean, they basically sold it to be an event space, mm-hmm. but it's not like kink is closing down. Um, most of their directors moved to Vegas, which is actually good for us because we're going to be moving to Vegas, and it kind of means that like kink and us share a talent pool. You know, as a matter of fact, we're setting up a store with them, so Ooh, you know, we're, we're kind of their their affiliates now. Um, so since we do share a, a, a talent pool, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be great that everybody's in Vegas because it's going to make easier make it easier for for performers to travel. It's kind of like if you want people from LA to come out to Vegas and you say, okay, if you come out for three days, you can have three shoots. It's a lot more worth it for them than just coming out for one company. So, you know, I'm hoping when we when we get into that, that we can we can do that for the benefit of all. Awesome. Now, the big move to Vegas, I know uh, California, it seems like for almost the past decade, probably longer, have been trying to legislate the adult film industry essentially out of business. I know on Twitter, um, you've posted some links about, uh, I guess there was one where they, they wrote the law in such a way that even watching it could somehow get you in, tr- could get the producers in trouble or something like that. Can you elaborate yeah, on why? Yeah, probably uh, well, that was that was voted down. It was kind of our big victory. Um, Prop 60 had a lot of deceptive parts to it that, that thankfully the the media and kind of caught on to. It's kind of like okay, the guy at AHF um, Weinstein was proposing that he would kind of be the porn czar for life with like a cushy salary. There was all kinds of stuff built into this bill that just made it awful. Um, and it, it really, the porn community really came together. Like we had a protest march. We had like um, the people at um, Free Speech Coalition just went on every radio show and every government meeting and every everything. Um, like we, everybody really made a big lot of noise about it and it actually got voted down. Um, which was cool because it, it was actually the weirdest evening because like Vivid had a, like a election watching party and everybody's there like looking at Prop 60 and everybody's like so happy because Prop 60 is being like um, defeated and then we start looking at the TV going wait a minute Hillary's losing and the party just kind of went like it was like the weirdest feeling like everybody was like so elated about one thing and so bummed out about the other thing it was really strange but the, the point is that they're there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of more restrictive laws in California, and it's kind of people are constantly, like, dealing with, with Cal OSHA um, to kind of, you know, make, make laws that are kind of reasonable for everybody in terms of, you know, safety on, you know, health safety on set and not making the laws just ridiculous. You know, like, nobody's going to want a dental dam for lesbian seats. It's just not, it's not going to work. And nobody's going to have goggles, you know, because, like, some might get in your eye. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, there's like ridiculousness there too. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I mean, I, I'm kind of like, since we're mainly a fetish company, like we use condoms because we're a measure B country and I don't think our fans really care that much because that's not, like if, if you want mainly scenes of people fucking, like you're not really going to go to our stuff because our stuff is mainly fetish with some fucking. So, you know, I, for other companies, it's a much, the condom thing is a much bigger deal than, than it is for us. But um, honestly, we are mainly moving to Vegas because it's so much cheaper. Um, right now, like our overhead has just grown in recent years and we're actually 
like we actually make good money and we knit, we're always broke because our overhead is so high, which is extremely frustrating. So that's the main thing we're, you know, we're getting away from. Like we can do, we can pretty much have the same thing we have here in Vegas for like 2000 less a month, which is huge. Jeez. Yeah. So it's, it's just, you know, like it's, it's just so much, you know, there's just so much of that. Plus, you know, plus honestly, I've lived in L.A. for more than 20 years and I'm really sick of the traffic. The traffic is awful. Oh, yeah. I keep um, hearing that. <laughs> It's, it, and I don't even drive during rush hour, and it's still like, it, it's just crazy bad. It's like LA is like the worst place in America. It really is. It's, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you, you, so many times you just get, you get stuck on the freeway going three miles an hour, going, okay, well, this is 90 minutes of my life. I'm never going to get back. It's just, it's just so irritating. So, you know, Vegas is, Vegas is like a much smaller city, and like whenever we've been there for, for AVN or whatever, like it's not nearly as bad. It's like driving around, it's like, hey, it's the freeway. And we're actually going freeway speeds rock. So we're, we're actually really looking forward to moving. Nice. Good. Well, um, one question that we have is uh, what level of scripting is there in the industry? And like for your film specifically, do you come up with uh, these premises and like work out the story on set? Or are your movies scripted from first frame to like the last? It depends on what it is. I do one or two features a year that are a completely scripted movie that I write a real script for. Um, like like our pre like our recent ex is fetish release of the year winner, uh, corrupted by the evils of fetish porn, is like a real movie with a beginning beginning and end and a real script. Um, a lot of the things we do, like our perversion and punishment series, or or some of our other things are more vignettes. Um, we have some scenes that are kind of vignettes with the plot within a, you know, within the vignette, but then the vignettes are different. And some of the things we do are basically BDSM, film BDSM sessions where it's more like we have a vague outline of what we want to do. But I pretty much like to hire doms who know what they're doing and kind of let them, her and the sub decide what they want to do. And then it's kind of more... It's kind of more akin to filming reality TV. It's kind of like it's loosely scripted, so you kind of vaguely know where it's going, but you're you're letting your people just kind of improv and roll with it. That makes sense. Nice. Um, another question. There's bad quality porn and good quality porn. As a creator in the industry, mm-hmm. what ingredients do you think make a good movie? Um, it kind of depends on what you want your porn for. I think for what makes a good movie in terms of a feature movie is the, the same things that make a good regular movie, except it happens to have hot, explicit sex in it. Um, you know, like you have to care about the characters, you have to be entertained by the plot, you have to see where it's going. It needs to have, you know, good production values. It needs to, you know, grab the grab the people watching it so they're, you know, so they're into it, they're not bored. Um, in terms of, it's, it's like there's porn, you kind of like, I think a big trend these days is watching porn as a couple of kind of foreplay, um, in which case you do want one of those movies, you don't want to like be there with your significant other, it's like, bam, instant double anal, because it's just not, that's not getting in the mood. <laughs> you, know, you want something that kind of starts and builds up and... And then you kind of get busy, and then about halfway through, you probably forget about the TV because you're doing your own thing. But you kind of want to roll into it like foreplay. Then there's the kind of porn you want if, like, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you have insomnia and you know you're going to get, like, to sleep much easier if you masturbate. You just kind of want to get off and get on with it. In mm-hmm. which case, honestly, quality doesn't matter. You kind of want to go to the things like the kink or whatever it is that gets you off the fastest. You want something that starts on that and then, you know, like, seven minutes later, you're done. So there's, I think, in the, the feature kind of porn or in, you know, in terms of doing fetish stuff where you really, like, if your fetish is, like, latex or something that lends itself to really pretty cinematography, you know, you're obviously going to want that. Um, it, it depends on people's taste. Some people care about stuff having good production values. Some people like kind of more of a gonzo raw look to it. So it's... It's really what, you know, it's, it's, it's a good movie if it gets you off and if it, and if it entertains you and if it, it serves your, you know, the purpose you have for it at the moment. Nice. Um, so with your role, uh, your active role in performers' rights, uh, what steps have you taken to make performers in your movies feel uh, comfortable? Um, we've given 
that a lot of thought. Um, I think partially, um, in a way, we're at an advantage because we're, we're a couple and we're literally old enough to be most of our performers' parents. <laughs> we're, kind of porn mo- we're kind of porn mom and dad. And I think that kind of immediately makes people feel comfy, like they know that, like we're not going to hit on them and we're not going to, you know, it's, it's going to have a homey, like we have good craft service, we have dogs they can play with. It's, it's kind of, um, we kind of have try to have a homey set. That's kind of part one. Um, oh, I always fun. tell people and really emphasize to people that if there's anything wrong, um, like if they're uncomfortable with anything or anything's going wrong, they have the absolute right to stop a scene because one of the things... I've heard in in APAC meetings that bothered me the most is a lot of performers said that a lot of times they'll just kind of, when things are wrong, they'll just kind of grit their teeth and get through it because they think if they stop the scene, the the producer will be, or the director will be mad at them, which is the the atmosphere that kind of the old guard of porn has perpetuated, and I think that's terrible. And so we really try to, you know, emphasize that that's not the case here and you know, I found in a couple of cases that still was the case here because, you know, like I have a conversation like a year later with somebody and they go, oh, yeah, in that scene, she pulled my hair so hard she hurt my neck. And I was like, well, why didn't you tell me that the time? Yeah. You know, like I would have done something about it. Um, but I think that's kind of a, there's like a big, you know, along with the Me Too movement and just in general, you know, people speaking up for performers' rights. I think there's a big shift going on in this where, where performers before, maybe didn't feel so empowered to speak up, but now hopefully they do. Um, so that's one one of the things with BDSM that kind of is a protocol that's always been there that I think should be there with vanilla sex too is in the BDSM scene, the, you sit down beforehand and the, the performers discuss their, their do's and don'ts and likes and desires and limits. And you stick to those limits. So you have a clear, even if you're improvising, you have a clear idea going in, you know, these are the things you can do, these are the things you can't do. Um, so, you know, you have you have a plan that's based on people's consent. And, you know, again, like people, like Keith does it very, very formally, like they have like a checklist that everybody has to fill out, which, um, which I think is good for them because they have like so many things going on, like they have so many like sites. Um, there's such a large company for us. We mainly we do it a little bit more informally. Um, we I tend to hire the like once I find a performer I like I tend to hire them over and over again. So we kind of have this kind of little repertory group of regulars who I trust, you know. And with them, and I'm kind of comfortable with you know like Sybil Choi and Marcelo have worked together like a zillion times. So I'm comfortable with them just kind of sitting down and going, okay, this is what we're going to do today. Blah 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 blah. Um, but I think the, the less you know people, the more formal you have to be. And if you have, you, if, when in doubt, be more formal and more thorough and more paperwork intensive than you think you have to be rather than the other way around. Um, and also, you have a responsibility to um, people to watch what's going on, even if people don't tell you about it. For instance, um, bringing up Marcelo, who's a very extreme performer, who's awesome, but it's kind of his... It's his aim in life to be the most extreme performer he can be, but he generally will not call holes. And there's been a couple of times where he's saying, like, yeah, we can go on, we're fine. It's like, no, you're, like, turning white and you're going to fake. You need to, like, stop. We need to take a break here. <laughs> um, and, and you kind of, like, you kind of need to know your people and know, like, who pushes the envelope too hard and, you know, who you kind of have to watch that way. So those, those are some of the things, but it's, it's an evolving thing. I think it's an evolving thing for the whole industry. And I'm glad you uh, mentioned that too, because you mentioned uh, APAC, the Adult Performer Advocacy Committee. Why is mm-hmm. why is that important for the film industry, and um, what should uh, fans uh, of the industry do to help support an organization like that? Great, because it, it basically they, they meet once every couple of months, and they have guest speakers. Like, for instance, I think the next one is going to be on taxes and how, as a performer, you know what deductions you can claim and like how you should be, you know what what receipts and stuff you should be keeping, and, and kind of how you should set up your finances, um, which is really important for performers. Because I think you know, like one of the things that people kind of don't remember is that performers are teenagers when they start, you know, and it's kind of like. Like, not all, but I think some girls are like, 
oh, wow, I just made $3,000. I'm going to buy a Gucci bag, you know? And it's like, no, maybe you should get health insurance first, girl. You know, it's that, it's that kind of thing. So I think, you know, APEC basically, I think the, the most important thing it does is give kind of beginners like the ability to meet with older performers who know, you know, who know how to deal with trolls, who know how to deal with their money, you know, who know what stuff you should bring to the set, just all those things that, you know, that performers learn. And I think that APAC also kind of gives performers a, a safe space where they can vent if things went wrong. Um, so it's, it's a really valuable resource and I really encourage performers to take advantage of it. And, um, I think, I'm not sure what fans can do about it. Um, just, you know, just know that this is like a good thing. And, you know, I guess, you know, if you've got a favorite girl and she's not, you know, taking part in it, you know, like, mention it. Like, do you go to this thing? Because it, it really, like, we really do want to get, you know, more people involved in it because it, it could be a really great thing, particularly for, for new people who can kind of feel really overwhelmed by the industry and kind of by the... You know, the, the, the weird response, like, there's also, like, this horrible thing that happens online. You get, like, these anti-porn nuts that give you death threats and call you horrible names and et cetera. And, like, so, I think when performers first get hit with that, it's just really upsetting. And, like, yeah. then after a while, girls learn to kind of, you know, just, like, block the idiots and move on. But it takes a while to get to that point. And, like, talking to other performers that have gone through this, like, helps them, helps them kind of understand how to deal. Nice. Um, so what, ch- I feel like that would probably tie into this next question, but what challenges do you face as a porn creator? I'm sorry, say that again. What challenges do I feel? What challenges do you face as a porn creator? Um, let's see. Um, well, in Cal- I mean, in California, it, it's, I think, like, the kind of the constant stress of what, what weird law are they going to throw at us next that has the potential to like completely wreck our business, which is kind of a very you know stressful way to operate. Um, for us personally, like the overhead thing is is big. Like we've been in our in our space for seven years and the, the rent has gone up steadily, so now it's just kind of at a spot where it's just stupid. Um, and just kind of like you know, I, I wish I could have bigger, like probably bigger budgets. You know, like if somebody gave me like an extra ten grand for each movie, or at least for the features, like that would just make my life so much easier and, and more funner. Um, those are kind of the big ones. Um, other than that, I mean, I'm really happy with what I do, and I don't, you know, I don't mean to complain about anything. And I, you know, I basically love our studio, but um, you know, th- I think those are the big ones. Other than that, I'm, I'm pretty happy with everything. Nice. Um, what artists have inspired your work? Um, that's a good question. I find that my best stuff comes out of my own experiences where I'm not really that influenced so much. Um, I think, let's see, who, what stuff have I watched that I thought was, I think um, the movies that Jackie St. James made with um, Eddie Powell as the, her cinematographer are just gorgeous. I was just really, like, impressed with those. Um... Let's see. Um, I, I think I probably get more, you know, I've, I've always been a film buff, so I have I have a lot of movies that I really like a lot. Um, you know, going back from, like, from the 40s to today, like, you know. I'm, um, but I think basically, you know, like I said, I think I take a lot of my inspiration from just kind of inside my own brain. Like, this, like what, whatever hits me is being like a hot thing to film and, and whatever, you know, whatever plot comes into my head kind of organically. Right. Ooh. Uh, I'm curious to know about your work as an animal rights activist as well. Yeah, I love animals. Um, we have four rescued dogs, and I, I really try to, I'm a vegan, and I really try to network I try to network shelter dogs and I try to make people aware of, of animal rights causes because I think that's kind of one of the things that kind of makes people good humans. Um, you know, I think like the, the old Gandhi phrase of, you know, the mark of any, the humanity of any civilization is how they treat, how they treat animals. And I think that's true. Um, you know, like I've always 
you know, like my dogs were there for me where nobody else was, you know, like I really, I'm, I, I've always been, had a, like a great affinity towards animals. So I kind of do the best I can in terms of, you know, like donating money to things and, and publicizing things as much as I can within my, you know, like my schedule and my budget. Nice. So hopefully I do it like a little bit to, to help that along. Cool. Um, next one here. This question is for Mora. Um, the, we mentioned it earlier with the tickle charger on, on, on uh, your uh, uh, on your Twitter page. You had some uh, sh- uh, little video clips of uh, you uh, as a performer with the tickle torture videos. Um, do you have any favorite? Right. On, do you have any favorite on screen moments from tickle torture videos, or just anything in general? <laughs> okay, okay. For tickle torture videos, this is going way, way back. Um, kind of in the, like the, probably like 10 years ago, um, the late January Seraf and I tickled Jewel Marceau, and Jewel was like, in some ways, like the worst tickle torture victim, in some ways the best one, she got really mad, she was like, okay, I don't like you guys anymore, fuck you, let me out of this, and she was so mad, it was just like, was let up on her, and it was hysterical. Um, I think that was, that was one of my favorite tickle torture things, and my other one was, we used to, uh, do them in a dungeon that had like a bondage cage with like a hole in the middle. So we had something called the Phantom Hand, where two, like one or two people would be tickling somebody who was tied to it, and then somebody would be in the cage, and all of a sudden, like the, an extra arm would come out and start tickling the person. And those were hilarious, and I kind of wish we could do that again, but we don't have that cage anymore. <laughs> um, just in general, as a performer, I think my favorite thing that I ever did was Treacherous, which is the movie that um, I co-directed with um, Aiden Starr, who's now with Evil Angel, um, which was a four-hour movie, and it was it was basically it's basically about um, kind of the backstage going nefarious backstage goings on at a uh, like an underground sex club. Um, where there's like a lot of, you know, machinations and fights for power, et cetera. Um, and I was like the club owner and I got to be like really bitchy and like bitchy and evil. And, and at the end, Aiden and I conspired to like kill this other guy and it was Kim Woodman. And it was, it's like one of my favorite, like that and Corrupted is like, I think the best things we've ever done. And like that was actually the movie that got, got us signed to XL Distribution, which, which really changed our life in a big way. So. I think that's that's probably my favorite, you know, acting moment. Nice. Um, so fun fact about me, I have a Fat Life account, well had one, but <laughs> In doing my, like, diggings around there, I noticed a lot of talk of, like, uh, what... There's a lot of talk about bad bad dom or, like, someone being a bad dom. What do you mm-hmm. think makes a good dom? And then also, what do you think makes a good sub? Um, well, first of all, for dom, it's skills. Right. Kind of, like, know what you're good at and know what you're bad at and... You know, don't do the stuff that you're bad at on a live human before you've had a chance to practice. Um, you know, for instance, there's like the old exercise of like if you're doing single tail whipping and you can't whip a light light switch in such a way as to turn off the light, your aim is not accurate enough to to be working on a live human. It's that kind of stuff. Like more advanced things really, really require practice and. Uh, it makes me crazy when it's, it's like I've said this whole bunch of times, but you know, just because you put somebody in latex and give them a flogger, it doesn't make them a dominatrix. And I think a lot of the more mainstream vanilla companies kind of do that sometimes, and it, it really makes me crazy because it's like, you know, this bitch is like hitting this guy in the kidneys, and like nobody is stopping this, and it's just wrong. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you know, we go back to you know, like we go back to this. You can get really seriously injured doing this stuff incorrectly. Thing. Um, so I think that's that's like the the one big thing with DOMS. You know what your skill set is, skill set, bleh, skill set is, and, and don't kind of overstep your abilities. And um, also, I think respecting respecting the sub limits is really important. And you know, don't you know, don't get carried away and don't like you know think, well, I'm just going to do this as a surprise. No, you know, you you agree to what what you can and can't do beforehand and you stick to that, like with, with honor. Um, I think that's too, you know, kind of being conscious of what your sub is experiencing, like checking for things like, are they getting pale or are any of their extremities um, 
turning blue, checking in with the sub, making sure that they feel okay. Mm. Um, I think one of the other things that makes, to me what makes, one of the things that makes a bad dom is somebody who thinks because they're a dom, they, they get to be like a bossy bitch 24-7. Oh, thank you. Which is, <laughs> like, I know some people do that, and I just think it's kind of, it, it's kind of like when, when Jimmy and I play, I'm the dom and he's the sub, the rest of the time we have like a normal, you know, we have like a normal equal relationship, and I think that's kind of like for, in, in the long term is a much kind of better way to go. So, you know, it's kind of like, also doms have kind of assumed that just because somebody else is a sub, that it's their sub. It's like, no, that person has agreed to be a sub to their mistress, not necessarily you, so don't order them around. It's like rude. So um, what makes a good sub is kind of trusting your mistress and not not uh, topping from the bottom, like which, which comes in, you know, which comes in a lot. Like if you're a pro dom, I think like less so in, in lifestyle situations, but there's a lot of people who come in to a pro dom situation and they have this scenario in their mind and they absolutely want it to be this way and they want to get all this stuff into the like the half an hour they can afford and you know like they're it's like do this do this do this do this do this and that's not really what makes for a good session um like one of the things one of the joys of being a sub is relinquishing control and letting the other person that's when it becomes like this relaxing release of a thing is when you give the control to the other person and if you've got a laundry list of the stuff you want the other person to do that's not what you know what you're doing and then there's like actually our our tips from a dominatrix take school dvds is a good is a good resource for that because we have all these doms kind of talking about like what they hate about their clients you know like obvious stuff like you know don't be late don't be smelly don't you know don't you know don't try to get a bargain all kinds of stuff but, but those are kind of the basics all right. Um, during the during the research for this episode, I mean, I, I, I realized that I didn't know as much about the adult industry as I thought I did, and I didn't think I knew much to begin with. Um, what misconceptions about the industry would you like to change in the general public? Oh my God, there's so many. I think the general, a lot of the general public got their idea of what the, the industry is like from Boogie Nights, which was set in the 70s, you know, or the Deuce, and it's so not like that anymore. Um, I think in part because, you know, I mean, there is kind of like an old school of sleazy asshole producers, but number one, those people kind of got displaced by geeks in the 90s when the internet came on. You know, it's like now if you go to, a, you know, ABM is just like any other business convention. It's like guys in polo shirts, you know, from the IT department and the sales department kind of thing. It's like it's a, it's a business. It's like a regular business. Um, I Our think audience. that's one. And I think two, um, unlike the mainstream industry right now, about 30% of the um, directors are women, which has changed the industry a lot because I think women understand kind of what their performers are going through because a lot of them you know came up from being performers so they kind of really get it in a way that I think like the directors of old didn't mm -hmm. and I think I think people think that porn stars are dumb and that they got into this as kind of a desperation move like they needed money for drugs or whatever which is completely not true um, you know as a matter of fact now there's so many people that get into porn that it's kind of like, there's like kind of too many people. Um, I think like, unless you're like really just drop dead gorgeous, it's, it's kind of hard to break in. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of people who think there's gonna be a lot of money in it and there's really not, unless you're like an A-list person, there really isn't. So, you know, if, if you don't genuinely like to have sex, you really shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> because it's it's just going to be an unhappy career for you, but you know for the most part, you know like I've been I've been in music, I've been in the music industry, you know I've been in kind of like mainstream journalism, I've been in the mainstream film industry, and I've been in porn, and like porn people are the smartest, coolest, most fun to hang out with people pretty much ever. I think there's like them and kind of like the heavy metal scene of the late 80s were like my favorite people. Um, <laughs> and, but like, I will take porn people over mainstream film people anytime. They're like, like so much nicer and so much more real. And, 
you know, and it's it's also like poor is way less sexist than the mainstream film industry, which nobody believes me when I say, but it's really true. And so it, it's kind of like the people in the industry kind of know that it's like this kind of awesome, well-guarded secret, like how great it is that nobody outside, you know, believes it and everybody kind of trivializes and belittles porn performers. Like, for instance... You know, Stormy Daniels is an award-winning director with Wicked. Like, she's a really big director who, like, everybody else is, like, an up-and-coming director looks up to. How many times has anyone mentioned that she's a director in the whole Trump thing? Like, I think Stephen Colbert mentioned it once, and that's the only time I can remember. You know, everyone thinks, like, thinks of her as a dumb bimbo, and she's not that at all. So th- those are some of the misconceptions. Got it. Um, well, how do you think um, technology has helped and hurt the industry? Um, probably the biggest thing. Well, I mean, it's obviously helped because it's made porn accessible to everybody. Right. Um, you know, like we have like our, our clips for sale store. I mean, we get we get sales from, you know, Afghanistan, Bangkok, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, like everywhere. Like it's accessible everywhere. Um, the I think probably the the worst part is kind of a, I do think that even though like we're now kind of on premium tube sites, so I shouldn't bag on them. I do think that that tube sites kind of really messed up the the income level for a lot of people. So I think that was that was kind of like a big hit that that everybody took. Um, I think in some ways people. I think a lot of people go crazy investing in technological advances when they don't necessarily pan out. Like, remember a couple of years ago, everybody went bananas for 3D porn. Like, nobody does 3D porn anymore. Um, similarly, like right now, there's this giant push to do 4K cameras where, you know, pretty soon everybody's going to have to get them. But the fact is that most people, like a lot of people watch porn on their phones or their iPads or something, and you really don't eat 4K because it's like a little screen. Um, stuff like that. I think that there's like it's a it's a double edged sword. I think you know there's like like we, we're considering like, doing 4K, but since we shoot with three cameras, that's like a you know like a twelve thousand dollar investment. So it's like a big deal to, to do that. Um, but but over, I mean overall, it's been you know technology has been good. It will be really interesting to see what happens with net neutrality. I think that's like the other the next thing that will be like interesting to see what happens if yep. either way if it, if it stays or if it goes if it goes it's going to change things a lot I think and I'm not sure how Got it. Um, one topic I've, I've heard in uh, interviews and in the podcast that I did and research for the episode was about piracy. Piracy affects the adult industry just as much as it does music, movies, TV shows. How oh, yeah. how does that affect your bottom line? What should the fans know about how their pi- their pirating a video affects you? Well, for, well, for starters should pay for their porn. It's kind of like if, if we don't get money, then we can't hire people. We can't make more videos. So if people completely stop paying for their porn, like the people who want, like what I was talking about earlier, people who care about having good porn as opposed to you know, like amateur crap that you can do for like $50, that's going to go away unless people have the resources to make good porn. Because porn, you know, good porn costs money. Um, so if people keep just being on tube sites and never paying for it, eventually all you're going to get is like tube site crap. Um, it's filmed in somebody's bedroom and you can see all like with bad lighting and like you can see like the, the wires from the, the tripod camera kind of thing. So that that's one thing and in some ways, I mean, we're basically, our our distributor has takedown piracy, so basically everybody, all the companies on the under the distributor pay and to take down piracy. So I think we have some, like we have some anti-piracy efforts going on. Um, and I'm glad that we don't have to do it ourselves because it's like it's very cumbersome. You have to do a lot of paperwork and it's, it's like a big hassle. Like before we kind of didn't deal with it because we weren't sure like the, the effort put in, put in to take down the piracy was kind of worth the, the amount of money we would get in return, because if people don't pay for their porn, they're they're not gonna. 
Right. You know, there's basically people who pay for their porn, people who don't pay for their porn, and people who are really set in the paying for their porn aren't gonna. So. Right. Uh, tell us about Plucker the Porn Plant. <laughs> oh, Porn Plant needs to needs to tweet more, but, but he just became a baby daddy, so so he has to, he has to take care of the youngster. Um, porn Plant Porn Plant lives in our studio. He's appeared in in many of our films. He, he wants to be the first plant. Who's a who's a Spiegler plant? And he's very upset that there there's not a best foliage category for ABN awards. <laughs> and um, basically, when when pretty girls take come over, he, he takes photos with them and, and tweets it on his Twitter, which he's supposed to do more regularly. But but sometimes we all get busy and. and you know, we forget to help him because obviously he doesn't have opposable thumbs. So that's, that's the story on porn plant. That lucky plant. Uh, <laughs> um, question, what do you think is the state of the adult film industry today? I think it's under, like, I think it's changing a lot. I think, like, the things I've mentioned previously, like the, the increase of, of nerds and female directors and the Me Too movement and kind of the additional emphasis on consent and people speaking up um, and kind of the, the push for ethical porn is kind of slowly but surely changing the industry. Um, like I said, I think there's an old guard and a new guard and, you know, there's kind of a, the, there's like people who are hanging on to kind of the old values and people who are like pushing hard on the new values and and that's kind of the transition that's going on right now. Um, I think a lot of people are frustrated because they're making like the, the people who remember the days when they were making money hand over fist are kind of frustrated by today because it's not as lucrative. So I, I would say like the people who just got into it to make money are kind of disappointed these days. Whereas like we got into it to make movies. You know, I got into it because I love to make movies. Like the, you know, back when we were doing the mainstream film group, like we would be getting up at like 6 a.m. to be like the lighting crew on somebody else's project that wasn't even very good. And I would still be like, oh my God, we're gonna go make a movie, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And I never really lost that. Like I love making movies, it's my favorite thing ever. So to me, as long as, you know, we can keep making movies and, you know, kind of we can pay our bills and buy dog food and stuff. I'm a happy camper, I don't have to be rich. So I still really love the porn industry, but I know that like some other people are kind of really bummed out. Nice. Um, well, I, you, you brought it up, the Me Too movement. Um, how has that affected uh, the porn industry? Um, I think that it, it's caused the, the porn industry to really look at consent seriously. Like if you um, if you look at, you know, like both ABN and XBIS had, had seminar panels on consent. I think, you know, a lot of the NOAA companies are kind of adopting the fetish model of um, you know, I really like talking about do's and don'ts and, and, you know, limits, you know, before a scene and not kind of springing things on people, which I know, you know, used to happen. Um, I think there's also a kind of recognition that some of the old practices of the industry were really wrong and that they needed to be corrected. And that's not so much the Me Too thing, but it, it's like, for instance, um, there was, there used to be a thing, or I think for some people still is, where girls would charge more for interracial scenes than, than non-interracial scenes, which is like completely wrong and racist, which has to go. Um, you know, there, I think the, it, the Me Too movement and just in general, kind of the changing of the guard that I mentioned is making the industry really kind of re-examine its values, and I think that's a really good thing. Nice. All right. Uh, my question was: um, You mentioned uh, on your Twitter many times about uh, your work on the Free Speech Coalition, and I believe you did mention it in this interview as well. Um, tell us, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about it and, and its importance to uh, the industry. Um, the Free, Free Speech Coalition is amazing. They pretty much were the the reason why we we're not right now labeling under the horrifying Prop sixty. Um, they really kind of went all out. They're they're an advocacy group for for the industry and they do an amazing job in advocating for for themselves. Everyone in the industry, join them. Give them some money. It's really worth it. They're really protecting all of our rights. Nice. 
Um, and so the last question that we have is what is the most important takeaway that you want our listeners to have from this whole conversation? Wow. Um, <laughs> a lot. Um, no pressure. <laughs> I, I guess the, the, the main things are, one, don't be ashamed of your kink. Enjoy it. Explore it. And, you know, find somebody to share it with. Um, that, that the porn industry is really awesome. Um, and it really is a family. Sometimes it's a dysfunctional family that fights. But, you know, as, as soon as, like, someone attacks it, it's like everyone circles the wagons and becomes, like, best friends. And um, basically that there's, you know, um, let's see, um, if, you're in, if you want to get into BDSM, please don't just do it. Please get some instruction or you can really fuck up badly. And, um, you know, find porn that speaks to you and watch it and please pay for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, with that, we'd like to uh, thank you once again for being on the show for, um, you know, just, you know, I, I did not think he, uh, you would say yes. And the fact that you said yes as fast as you did uh -huh. meant of course I would. It, it, meant, it really meant a lot. Um, and, and hopefully uh, this interview, uh, you know, uh, does does you justice. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we did. We did you proud. <laughs> well, it's, it's my pleasure. And, and like tweet it when it's up wherever it's going up and I'll retweet for you. Gotcha. Um, do you have anything you would like to plug? Um, yeah. Let's, um, for all things severe, come to severe, uh, severesexfilms.com. Um, buy a membership. It's awesome. And you can, like, get all of our stuff there. Um, we are also going to be available on kink.com pretty soon, as well as Pornhub, Pornhub Premium. Clips for sale, and I want clips, um, all of which were, like, clips for sale we had for a long time, but the other ones we're kind of setting up now. Um, you can also get our stuff on uh, fetish movies, hot movies, Game Link, and ABN, or on DVD from store.severesexfilms.com. Our Twitters are, mine is Severe Society, my beloved Jimmy Broadway is Fetish Director, and of course, Porn Plants is Porn Plants. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an important one to follow but once again thank you for being on the show and uh, everybody tune in again next week thank you for listening and with that a very special bonus episode of friends talking nerdy is in the books we thank you all for listening this is tim jowsma uh once again we would like to thank d severe um for her time on the show here for a very fascinating interview um the only reason is that this is a bonus episode was I was so happy with the results. I wanted you all to hear it right away. I didn't want you all to wait um, for the end of the Buffy uh, conference. I didn't want you to wait two weeks to listen. You needed to hear this right away. Um, Dee's a fascinating woman, and I'm glad we uh, got to spend some time with her talking um, about uh, an industry that doesn't get enough legitimate attention these days, in my opinion. Um, as always, we would like to thank Christopher Lazaric for his wonderful theme song. Head to ChristopherLazaric.com for information on how to buy his EP, Here's to You, which is available on all digital platforms. You can also stream um, his album on music services like Apple Music, Google Play Music, on services like that. But as an independent artist, you are definitely helping him out more by actually purchasing it. So help him out. He's a great guy, made a great song. He's a great singer. Um, you know, we want to do what we can to help out people who've helped us out. Um, our regular scheduled programming will resume this uh, Wednesday night, Thursday morning with part three of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer discussion. Um, Jason, Mora, and I wrap up um, the final seasons of that show and uh, give, our, give our thoughts on it. Um, and this will be the second episode that will be featured on LRM online as well. Um, I'm very happy that uh, I get a chance to uh, work with the LRM family again. Um, they were they were essential in in me getting to this point. Um, th th yeah, so anything I can do to help them out, I'm going to bend over backwards because they are a great group of people there. Um, so w once again, feel free to listen to um, our uh, regular, regularly scheduled episode this Wednesday night with the part three of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer discussion. Um, once again, thanks uh, to uh, D Severe for taking time out of her uh, day to be on the show. Follow her on Twitter and purchase her content at severesexfilms.com. Thank you very much. All right, you guys, I got a few porn scenarios for you to choose from. Hey, everybody. Got a pizza delivery for this sorority house. 
Did somebody order sausage? Wow, but the can to bow, but the wow, I got a bow, and the bow. Peter, what the hell are you doing? Knock it off. Uh, we brought you some wine, but it's best chilled before dinner. Oh, that is so nice of you. Yeah, let's put it on ice. Oh, you'll have to excuse my kitchen. I've been cooking all... Girls, I've just finished grading your midterms, and it's not good news. Looks like you're gonna have to do some extra credit. Peter, what the hell? I am so sorry about this. Look, dinner's just about ready. Why don't I get you seated in the dining room, and then we'll pour the wine. All right, new arrivals. There's only one way you're not getting on that train. Bow and kick a bow, 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 b